let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you for the sun on our faces. Thank you for the little things that remind us that you're always looking out for us. Your faithfulness is renewed each and every morning. Your love is ever present. We're so grateful to be invited into the sphere of it, Father. What an incredible blessing times like this are to fellowship together, to break bread together. And on that note, we pray for those that aren't here this morning for whatever reason, that you return them to the fold so that we might enjoy times like this with them as well. Father, we pray for those that are still lost in this world without hope. Time is short. Life is short. Your will be done. May we bring them the gospel that they might be humbled, repent, receive saving faith before it's too late. Father, we're most grateful and thankful, of course, for your son's work on the cross to cancel out that debt, to make times like this special for each one of us here. Hearing this message this morning, may we never become familiar with this blessing, North Christian Church. We just ask for your blessings on this morning's message. May it be edifying for our souls. We ask this in Jesus Christ's precious name. By the power of the Spirit, we do pray. Amen. Again, part 64 of the book of Hebrews. Um, let's begin where we left off last time with a couple of principles. First, the Spirit impressed this principle on us regarding our own perspective up here on the board. Know your destiny. And this morning's message is going to be a little longer than normal, so just pace yourself if you've got drinks. Know your destiny. The writer of Hebrews draws his audience of believers into fellowship with their destiny as co-victors with the champion who overcame death itself. And therefore, any real opposition we might face in life from our enemies. Know your destiny. Cling to it. Own it. Abide in it. Then the Spirit gave us Jesus' perspective. Remember, there's always two sides of this thing. There's sort of the manward side, and then there's the Godward side. Two different perspectives on each and every event in life itself. Up here on the board, Jesus knew his destiny. Jesus condescended to earth in order to become like those he intended to save. Philippians 2, 6 through 8. This was his mission. And when he accomplished it, he became our relatable champion over that which stood between us and God from the fall. And that was death itself. Remember God's promise. Dying you shall die. If you disobey, it didn't matter what the fruit was. There was no real poison indicated in the Bible as to even what the fruit was or the poison in it. There was nothing of that sort in Holy Scripture because it wasn't about the fruit. It was about the disobedience. And the Spirit has a lot to say about obedience this morning. So let's keep these two points in mind as we get back to our primary passage. Go to Hebrews 2.17. This is where we left off last week, Hebrews 2, verse 17. Good to see Jim and Robin back. All right, good to see you, Coach. Robin, wherever you are back there, I'm assuming you're sitting on your chair. Good to see you. Good to see your feet. Hebrews 2.17, therefore, he had to be made like his brothers 
his brothers. In other words, there's a family concept in view here. Now cling to that this morning. Family. Say it with me. Family. Family. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Over the past few messages, we've been drawn to contemplating Christ's personal love for us. He considers us brothers and sisters. Allah, verse 17. We noted this not that long ago as well in verses 11 and 12. Go there, verse 11 and 12. We went through this earlier. For he who sanctifies and those <clears throat> who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. So the point is that Jesus speaks of believers as siblings, as family. Paul, who was personally trained by Jesus, what an incredible honor that is, wrote of this same thing. Go to Romans 8.29. Romans 8.29. Romans 8.29 For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined, the Spirit is going to sprinkle in election and predestination a little bit this morning as well, which is appropriate. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Again, we are family. And then there's the very words of Jesus himself during his ministry on earth. Go to Mark 3.31. Mark 3, verse 31. So there's certainly no shortage of encouragement in Holy Scripture on the topic that we are family. Not just you and I, but all of us with Him. Mark 3, 31. And His mother and His brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. And a crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered them, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking about at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, whoever is obedient, whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. That person is my family. That person abides in my love. The point the Spirit's been developing here is a familial one up here on the board regarding Christ's perspective. Jesus came to save those whom God predestined. 
He had a very special love for those in his family. Those called according to God's supreme purpose. He laid down his life for them to purchase their freedom. Do you understand what's going on here? This family existed before you and I were ever even born, before human history, before any man was even formed out of the ground. This family bond existed from eternity past. And if you are saved, you are you were part of that consideration with God, with Christ, who came out of heaven to accomplish the one task to bring you into the fold. That's Christ's perspective. Jesus Christ came to save those whom God predestined. He had a very special love for those in his family, those called according to God's supreme purpose. He laid down his life for them to purchase their freedom. Now here's an analogy. This is going to be tough, but just pretend for a moment that you were in possession of perfect love. I know. Not really attainable. But let's just pretend. Which, by the way, implies that your love is sacrificial by nature. If a member of your family was imprisoned by a cruel tyrant, would you do whatever you could to get them released? If given the option, would you lay down your life for your family? If your love was 100% pure and selfless, therefore sacrificial, you would. You would. Because that's what love is. It's sacrificial. It's giving. It's grace. This was Christ's motivation, you see. To save those whom he loved from eternity past. That was his motivation. He loved you before you were even born with a very special love. This is why he said those famous words in the Gospel of John. Go to John 15, 13. John 15, 13. <clears throat> this is why he said this. Greater love has no one than this that someone lay down his life for his friends. So Jesus set the bar when he said that, didn't he? He said, there's no greater love than this. Not this. This. So Jesus set the bar indeed. I mean, that's what family does for each other, isn't it? Well, at least the selfless members, selfless members, not selfish, they're really good at just taking. But that's not grace. That's not God's economy. So what's the encouragement we receive from Jesus Christ, our prototype in John 15, 13, that says, greater love is no one than this, that someone laid on his life for his friends. Well, all we have to do 
is back up in the passage a few verses. Go to verse 9. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. Make sure, as a side note, when you read that, make sure that you don't interpret this as, quote, emotional love. It's verse 10 that qualifies it as obedience. There is no godly love without obedience. You can say you love the Lord all, with everything you've got. You can scream it from a housetop. But if there's no obedience, guess what? It's garbage. Go read James this afternoon. Faith without works is what? Dead. Dead. And he says, abide in my love. Verse 10. If you what? Keep my commandments. That's what it means to abide in his love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. That's the connective tissue between love, godly love, and obedience. So you could take this gum flapping and put it in the trash can. I'm going to give you now one of the most important principles any pastor could give any sheep right now. So listen up, up here on the board. What does abiding in love mean? Jesus clearly stated that to abide in his love is a function of obedience. This is a reference to a life lived in the sphere of God's love. The only way to enter and remain is through obedience. Obedience. When you think about the big picture, they're just about synonyms. If you keep my commandments, if you obey, then you abide in my love. That is alien to the average human being on earth. They think love is compromise. They think love is watering down the truth, softening the blow from Holy Scripture even. That's not love. That's disobedience. Do you understand? Obedience. This, look, Abiding in love and obedience are inextricably tied to one another. It's not an option. I'll say it again. This is one of the most important things I could ever teach a believer in Christ. There are a lot of churches, I'm sure of it, at this moment, Spinning up emotions. Probably some pretty loud music. Spinning up emotions 
and claiming that is love. That is not love. If there's no obedience, if that's the end of it, that's not love, that's emotionalism. That's feeding some need that the, every human flesh has. Not the spirit, not the new creature. The new creature thirsts for obedience. Whatever you want, Lord. Whatever you want from me. Tell me. Please, tell me. Okay, read your Bible. Read your Bible. Read your Bible. I'm telling you every time you read your Bible. That's the import of what? Reading your Bible. It's not emotionalism. It's not how you feel. It's not how offensive you think the truth is in your life. It's that you get the truth in your life. Please take some time to meditate on this today. I promise you, it doesn't get any better than that. Verse 10, John 15. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. These things I have spoken to you. Why? Why, pray tell, Lord, so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be what? Full. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Look, <laughs> the very fact that he's commanding it does that not imply obedience? So, in verse 13, we have a glimpse of Christ's heart and motivation towards others. In verse 9 through 12, we are encouraged to imitate Christ's love for other members of God's family the way he did without obedience to his Father's will, there'd be no love. It'd be lip service. And if we back up one more verse, we see the ultimate goal. What's the outcome of abiding in the sphere of love? What's the outcome of obedience? Look at verse 8. John 15, verse 8. By this, my Father is glorified. The goal of all obedience to God's will. He is glorified. That you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. What's the greatest fruit a disciple can ever bear love. Love. So the greatest fruit that you can bear, that others can see, is your obedience. Anybody can say, I love. But what about obedience? That I can see. That kind of devotion manifests in an inward drive, a thirst to do God's will. That's the fruit here. So I hope you see how laying down one's life, verse 13, abiding in love through obedience verses 9 through 12, and glorifying God, verse 8, that's just in reverse order, all exist in the same sphere. You don't have one without the other. That's the point. How many times have I taught that, right? 
You don't have love without obedience. You don't have obedience without laying down your life. You don't glorify God unless all of that is true. It's all in the same sphere. You see? We talk about parts of it, but it's part and parcel one of the other. Religion says, no, 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 I can pluck out this and, you know, I'm doing good. No. You'd be lucky if you're saved. You'll be lucky if you're saved. Again, this was all to amplify the point on the board, up here on the board. Christ's perspective. Jesus Christ to save, came to save those whom God predestined. He had a very special love for those in his family. Those called according to God's supreme purpose. And he laid down his life for them to purchase their freedom. Because that's what God the Father wanted him to do. He said, let's go get those in our family, shall we? And for the joy set before you, you're going to go all the way to the cross and you're going to show them, you're going to show them how much I love them and have loved them from eternity past. He said, okay, we're family. That's what family does. That's what love is. I will obey. He glorified God through obedience and love, laying down his life. The net net of what the Spirit's saying is simple and relatable. Relatable. Three words. We are family. Do you get it? So, we ought to also have a very special love for one another. And this love ought to supersede any other love we have in this world. Now, I know that some of you are like, whoa, dude, I was good up until that point. I don't love you more than I love my blood relatives. You might have said that to yourself just now. I understand. But just consider that in many cases, those people you say you love more than me or anybody else sitting here aren't members of God's family. I know you want them to be, but they're not. And don't get mad at me for saying that. And stop watering down the gospel to try to wedge them into or through the gates of heaven. <laughs> you're hurting them and you're hurting yourself in doing so. What sets you free? Thank you. Do we water down the truth to make it more palatable? Digestible? Reasonable? No, never. It's not your call. So, you won't be spending eternity with those folks. You'll be, spending <laughs> you'll be spending eternity with me. Sorry. Being silly, but I hope you get the point. Paul alluded to this type of behavior as well. For example, go to Galatians 6, one. Galatians 6, verse 1. We are family.
what kind of brother would I be if I lie to you every Sunday morning? And I say, oh, I don't want to offend you. God forbid I use language that triggers you. God forbid I tell you the truth about this world and how disgusting it is against God's grace, mercy, and love. God forbid I do that. Why don't I just do what everybody else does? Brendan, let's get another few people at the band. Let's get a, I don't know, a rock star drummer. Make sure he has long hair and it's curly. You know, has a, a Slayer shirt. You know, let's, let's make sure we have a bunch of stuff going on up here. Let's just put on an emotional show. This place would be packed. I wouldn't be being a good family member if I did that. That's not obedience. That's disobedience. And therefore, it precludes me or precludes it from being love. Galatians 6 1. Brothers, in other words, Paul's saying, listen up, family. I'm talking to my family here. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. What's the law of Christ? Love. Love. What does he say here? Bear one another's burdens. Sounds like a command in the Holy, in Holy Scripture, doesn't it? Hmm. Do that, obey, and you fulfill the law of Christ. You abide in Christ's love. It's a parallel to John, what we just read in John. Verse 3, For if anyone thinks he is something, then he is nothing. He deceives himself. But let each one test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor. For each one will have to bear his own load. Let the one who is taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary of doing good. Doing good means obeying. For in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone and especially, especially, if you've only got so much time, because God knows how busy you are watching reruns, if you've only got so much time, then at least direct that time and energy towards those where? Of the faith. Especially to those who are of the household of faith. In other words, that's your number one priority. When's the last time you said, to hell with my family on Thanksgiving or Easter or Christmas. I'm going to go spend it in the middle of the city with a bunch of people I don't know on a sidewalk. Why don't you do that? Because you have a special love. You especially love your family. That's what you do. That's what family does. We give priority to one another. That's what family does. And when one of us screws up, what do we do? We restore them. We bear their burdens while they're being restored. Let me help you get off the ground here. By the way, you suck, but I'm still here with my hand open helping you off the ground. That does sound like family, doesn't it? How many times are we going to do this? Stop already. Remember Bob Newhart? Five bucks. The armchair uh, psychologist. I got a problem. Five bucks. Stop it. Here's a question for you. What's the root word of especially? 
special, special. That's the theme here this morning, special. We're all special in God's eyes. It's okay, let it go. Weep if you must, I feel like it. I'm special in God's eyes? What the heck? How's that even feasible? When's the last time you thought about that? Please don't let this message escape your heart. It's supremely encouraging. You are special to God. Open up your heart. Let it rip. Let whatever is in you grow. You're so special that he became a man and died for your sins, for your transgressions. So that members of his family could be healed for all of eternity. So with that as the backdrop of your otherwise pathetic, self-absorbed, disgusting life, does anything else in this world even matter? Honestly. Does anything else in this world even matter? I just went through this personally. I had a really difficult week. Work has been berserko. And I just let the Word of God minister to me more than ever. And now I'm at rest. Because you know what he said to me? He goes, you dummy. You let yourself get caught up. Don't forget what really matters. Does any of that stuff that's bugging you even matter? We're talking an eternal brand of love here. Pre-existed us. Not a fleeting one for unbelievers that we'll leave at the grave when we die. This is a special love for special people, and it manifests itself in our doing for others in the faith, especially because they are family. Go to Romans 12.10. Romans 12.10. Especially, root word special, Romans 12.10, <clears throat> love one another with brotherly affection, you know like family. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Now I'm going to give you the Greek up here for the word outdo from pro -agiamai. Outdo one another. Don't just say I love them. Outdo them. means to lead onward by example, go on, prefer. Strong's, that's from Strong's. In context, in Romans 12.10, means we ought to set an example for each other by expressing love to those in the faith. A preferential treatment, even. Sometimes I think we give those outside the faith more preference than those in. Why? Well, only you can answer that. That's what it means, though, to outdo. 
It means to give more. You say, I'm just going to go for broke. Romans 12, 10. Again, love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo. Set an example. Why are you always waiting for others to step forward? There are people that are hearing my voice right now. They hardly ever do anything of their own initiative. It's always, well, I guess I'll do it if I get sucked into the vortex. Well, I guess if everybody else is doing it, I guess I'll do it. Take some initiative. Step out. Love. Outdo one another. Don't sit there like a lazy butt and wait for everybody else to do for you. Who owes you anything in the first place? What have you earned and deserved that you can sit back and eat the quiche and do nothing? Why don't you pick up the phone? Say, hey, nothing to do with me here. How are you today? When's the last time you ever done that? When's the last? All right, here's a, I'm not saying this because I better not get a bunch of phone calls. When's the last time you picked up the phone and said, "Hey, Pastor, how are you today?" No, 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 no. Not here's my problem. What do you have for advice for me? No, 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 no. How are you today, sir? How are you doing today? How's your life been? I know you've been busting your ass. Because we can't afford to pay your salary. How are you today? When's the last time anybody in here has done that? And please don't call me today. Do you follow what I'm getting at? And that's not a guilt trip. That's on you. This is the Spirit saying, when's the last time you outdid somebody? You say you love, but there's nothing there. Does that make sense? Again, that's not about me, so please don't be calling me up. That's on you. That's your conviction, not mine. I'm not even saying I do a great job at that always. But honestly, when's the last time you called anybody in the family, this family, and said, hey, nothing to do with me. I'm not going to drag my problems into your life. How are you today? Because I care. Because I consider you my brother or my sister. I legitimately care. How are you today? I'd be willing to bet everybody that was convicted calls somebody not in God's family regularly, how are you today? Am I on crack? I don't think so. That's why it's really quiet in here. Again, what's verse 10 say? Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. That's what a loving family ought to do. Outdo one another in love. Why is the Spirit bringing all of this up here on a fine, sunny Sunday morning? <laughs> oh, oh, still quiet. You must be really convicted. Mm -hmm. Why don't you just do this? Let's just get it over with. Just add the body language. You know. But why is he bringing this up? Don't make this about me and you because it's not. Trust me. Because back in our primary passage in Hebrews, we're being taught about Christ's motivation, his love, in sacrificing his life for those whom he knew and loved from eternity past, namely his family. That's what we're looking at. A love that transcends human history, that reached across a chasm, that expressed itself in grace, that was willing to rescue you from certain death. Now, when we realize this love he had for us, we are drawn into it. 
I would argue, you can argue back, it doesn't matter. It's a toss-up, I think I've said this before. If you ask somebody, what's the one thing that you really want in life? They're either going to say peace or love, right? Some kind of peace, love, contentment, it's all the same thing, kind of. I would say love. I would say most people would go through hell and high water just to know that they're loved. And when you see that kind of love, what does it do? It draws you to it. You say, that's what I'm looking for. This world's terrible. I need that. I want love. I want to know that at least one person in this stinking world gives a crap about me, loves me. Not only that, love me from eternity past to pay for my sins, to rescue me, that's what I want. And you're drawn to it. So in my notes here I have, isn't it a lot easier to, quote, fall in love with someone who first loves you? Isn't that part of the draw? Aren't we inherently suspicious? Aren't we guarded? We don't like being vulnerable. Aren't all the insecurities and doubts that typically keep us from fully committing to a relationship extinguished once we're convinced the other person's love is true? Isn't that the very dance that we go through in any meaningful relationship we've built in our lives, romantic or otherwise? Yeah, that's the dance. I'm going to move half step closer. I don't know, it seems like they, it seems like they have a real love. Okay, I'm going to half step closer. I'm going to half step closer. We slowly are drawn into that kind of love. Now, when we apply this to the spiritual life and the love that we realize God had for us from eternity past, nonetheless, and how that love hung on a cross 2,000 years ago, then and only then do we begin to understand Christ's heart. And when we do, the great words of the Apostle John ring true in our hearts forevermore. Go to 1 John 4.19. First John 4, 19. Raise your hand if you don't like the idea of being loved. Who doesn't want love? Do you want a fleeting love from the world? A selfish kind of love? A love that might exist for as long as you're worth it? Or do you want a love that transcends human history? A love that existed and was directed at you personally before you were even born. One that cannot be shaken. One that cannot be diminished. One that is unflappable. One that's indescribable. Hmm. Sounds familiar. 1 John 4.19 We love because He first loved us. That's how He draws us to Him. We love because He first loved us. He's the one who crossed the chasm. There was nothing special about you. You were dead in your trespasses and sin. By nature, a child of wrath. You didn't even like God. Never mind love Him. Certainly didn't want to obey Him. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, quote, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. In other words, that's the sphere of God's love.
You can't have one without the other. Otherwise, you're a liar. John's words describe the sphere of love that I've taught about so many times over the years. And truly, it's a familial, familial, family, familial type of love that the Godhead has shared for all of eternity. Have you ever thought about that? That this love that we're invited into, this sphere, pre-existed humanity? This familial, this family type of love existed in the three persons of the Godhead long before humanity was even on earth. That's the kind of love we're talking about here. So we must consider that that sphere existed before human history even began, before we were even saved and knew of God's special love for us. This is why it is so appropriate that John wrote, we love because he first loved us. In other words, we'd never know this kind of eternal love or ever hope to be invited into the sphere of it if God didn't love us from days past before we were even born. You see, that's a special kind of love, isn't it? Isn't it? That's the kind of love that blows our minds. Isn't it? That's the love that hung on a cross for you. How about that? That's the kind of love that considered you lost in your depravity, without hope, and said, I choose you. What? What? Have you seen me? Yep. I'm actually going to go to the cross for that. So I can present you spotless and blameless. So I can call you brother. I saw you. I choose you. That's the essence, if you really want to get down to it, of the doctrine of election. God chose you, which, by the way, is very evident in the famous verse up here on the board, John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. How's that for love? So that's a good solid sidebar, I think on the love of Christ, which also amplifies the recurring principle over the past few weeks up here on the board. Christ willingly ceded superiority temporarily to accomplish a specific goal. That's the big why. Is he loved us. You're special to him. Your family. Why else would he do that? Why else would he come out of heaven? Perfect unity and fellowship in a familial relationship that pre existed all things that we know of. Why would he abandon that for you? Have you seen you? Can you explain that? Paul said, you know, maybe for a good guy, someone might think about it. Doesn't mean they would do it even. Just maybe for someone that's a really swell guy, maybe someone would think, I'll, maybe I'll lay down my life for that person. But you? Come on. So that brings us back to our primary passage before we close. 
Go to Hebrews 2.17. Hebrews 2.17. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. He said, basically, I'm in this with you. Let's do this together as a family. I'll lead the way. How about that? We're in it together. I'm going to let my, I'm going to become one of you. And I'm going to allow myself to be tempted from without by the devil himself even. I'm here with you. Let's lock shields. So the theme this morning has been, why? Why, Jesus, would you ever think of doing that? Because let's face it, if any one of us were given the option, hmm, I'm in perfect fellowship with God. And there's a cockroach down there with feces on it. Do I want to leave this position to go save that thing? Come on. Most of you step on cockroaches if you see them, if you can catch them. Right? Why? The only answer I can give you is actually a very simple one. And it's one that's laid out in the Bible. Every which way. If you're open to it. Because apparently, based on all that God has done for you as a believer, as one of his children, this is crazy. Apparently, you are unexplainably special to God. Apparently. That's all I can tell you. Don't ask me why. Why? Why? Why would he choose any of us? Why, furthermore, why would he come out of perfect fellowship with his family in heaven to save me? It's unexplainable. How am I special to him? But, as the Bible teaches us, from eternity past, God has had a very special love for you personally. He formed a plan to save a family out of a depraved world. And you, my friend, were chosen to be in it. Do you ever suffer imposter syndrome? You know what that is? You know what imposter syndrome is? Imposter syndrome is when you're in a position and everybody seems to be, okay, it's the right guy for the job, right girl for the job, whatever. And you're like, I'm not. I don't know how I got here. I wonder when someone's going to figure this out. That's imposter syndrome. When you're in a position or a circumstance And everybody else seems to be convinced that you're the right person in that situation. But maybe you're not. You've got doubts. So you feel like an imposter. You ever feel like that? I do. I'm like, maybe screwed up. I'm I'm being silly. But you know I'm getting at, right? Like, have you seen me? And you chose me? To borrow from John? Take all that. This is why you love him today. This is why you are drawn to him. Because he first loved you. Because he chose to cross that impasse. You being dead. He chose by grace to save you. It's most definitely not because there was some sliver of goodness or love in you as a child of wrath. 
you formerly hated the things of God as an unbeliever. You may not have stated it that way, but your actions spoke so loud. You formerly hated the things of God as an unbeliever. As you followed the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, namely the devil. That's Ephesians 2.2, 2, in case you were wondering. And before you were saved, before you knew God's love for you, and before you loved him back, you lived in the passions of your flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and of the mind, and were by nature a child of wrath like the rest of mankind. That's Ephesians 2, 3, in case you were wondering. And before salvation, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. And that's Ephesians 2, 1, in case you were curious. Are you getting the picture yet? You hated God by your actions, by your very nature. You are a child of wrath. A son of disobedience, no different than anybody else in this world that literally despises the Lord. I don't need Jesus. I got everything I need right here. I don't need to obey God. I'm not even sure there is a God. I'm just going to deny this creation. Romans 1. Look. Look. You are special to God for some reason you cannot explain or attribute to anything you have done. What happened to our slides, Chris? Okay, that's good. Just listen to me. Pay attention to me. You are special to God for some reason you cannot explain or attribute to anything you have ever done. Please don't ever forget this. And if you're ever in duress, like the local assembly in the book of Hebrews, the idea is to fall back on these fundamental truths about your life. Have a tough week. Go back to the truth about your life. That somehow, unexplainably, you were special enough for God to choose you. Don't let the devil rob you of your peace. It's yours. It's your destiny. Peace was given to you from the Lord. Remember? My peace I give to you, not as the world gives. John 14, 27. You are special. You are loved. You are saved. The rest, my dear friends, <laughs> it's just white noise. It's just white noise. You are special. You are loved. You are saved. It's just white noise. So enjoy this day, this love, this life in Christ. Really, look up at the sun today. Say, thank you, Lord. Here I am. It's unexplainable that I have this kind of peace in my life. But here I am. Here I am. You are dead. But God has made you alive in his son. And this was what was on Christ's mind when he chose to lay down his life for you. 
up here on the board. Again, Jesus Christ came to save those whom God predestined. He had a very special love for those in his family. Those called according to God's supreme purpose. He laid down his life for them to purchase their freedom, to rescue them, to rescue you. Like last week's blog said, own it. That's for you. Own it. That's who you are to him. Do it. James 1.22 Be doers of the word. Own it. Own your life. This life you're living was purchased for you out of a special love that you don't deserve. So own it. Your life, you know, you know the one you complain about, was unexplainably worth the price he paid to him. Can you explain it? Just own it. You are special. All the proof you'll ever need hung on a cross 2,000 years ago. Don't let the white noise get you down. As this week's blog titled The Value of Affliction stated up here on the board, please don't conflate affliction with despair. They're not the same thing. Don't mix them together. If you had a rough week, don't go the despair route. Embrace it. Own it. God loves you. If anything, God uses suffering in your life to remind you of His love for you. This ought to bring you great joy. Granted, purification requires heat. Lots of it. But do not be discouraged, for God is at work in you as he promised. Satan would love nothing more than for you to throw in the towel under false pretenses, which is something I see many Christians threatening to do. And that's a tragedy. So please, Read this week's blog very closely, multiple times if you must, because it's meant to free you from bondage and suffering. It's part and parcel of this morning's message. I hope you see it. God is working something out in you that he had to work out 2,000 years ago with a small house church somewhere in or near Rome. That's the book of Hebrews. This is an old story, my friends. You got to see the forest through the trees. And when you do, when you have that aha moment, you'll be ever so grateful to the Holy Spirit for this ministry. Trust me. You are truly special in God's eyes. Do not, not ever, let the stress or strain of this world rob you of this truth. To do so is to rob God of his glory and give it to the devil and the desires of the devil himself. Don't ever do it. Own it. Own your life. Amen? Bards.
Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you for giving us truth that sets us free. Thank you for choosing us to be a part of your holy family. It's unexplainable, Lord, but here we are. We just ask for your blessings as we take the things we've learned back to the privacy of our own souls, back to our families. We ask this in Jesus Christ's precious name. By the power of the Spirit, we do pray. Amen.